Is the mic on? I don't need a mic for you to hear me, but I think they're recording, and only I still haven't figured out whatever volume you have, how to get on a recording without having one of these mics and it working. I bring you greetings from our North American Division president, uh, who is Canadian, Dan Jackson. But the real reason I came is to bring a message. Uh, my daughter lives in this area, so I spend my, uh, usually most of the month of July here on vacation. But I've had the privilege of uh, speaking here and from several churches. I understand this is the only church in this area that has opened the two Sabbaths of, of camp meeting. When I was here last summer, I had a message about Jonah. Is Jonah alive? I told you the rest of the story would come later if I were invited and, and Ed invited me. And so, in fact, next Sabbath and then August 31, I will be back up here for a short time. I will finish the story of Jonah. For those of you who were not here and maybe a little older that don't remember or younger too, uh, what we covered uh, last year, it's been a year ago. Let's do a, I'll do a, a brief review. Is Jonah alive? I believe the stories in the Bible are not only about Jonah or Hosea, or John, or James, but are for us. And we can see something there. The reason they're in the Bible is to show us how we relate to those situations. Jonah was called by God. He was a prophet from the northern kingdom. He lived about three miles north of Nazareth. He was a prophet to the northern kingdom. But God asked him to do something that was out of his comfort zone. He obeyed God in his prophecies to the northern kingdom. But now God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Remember in chapter 1? Now, to refresh your memory, Nineveh was the capital of the greatest oppressor at that time of Israel. Had gone in and killed many of Israel, taken their land, uh, taken many of the people, uh, had done all kinds of atrocities, more than once. And God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. By the way, have we ever faced something where God wanted us to do something that was totally out of our comfort zone? To Jonah, uh, to Jonah it would be unpatriotic and against his very religion and kingdom. Against his God. Because Nineveh had made proud announcements how their God was greater than the God of Israel because look what we were able to do to them. So it seemed to be against God, His religion, and His country to go and do that. So Jonah, instead of going northeast 500 miles to, Jonah, uh, to Nineveh, goes, heads out 2,000 miles in the opposite direction. Over to an area of what we know today as Spain. He got on the boat, and then there are a, a total of 12 amazing, supernatural, and sometimes totally miracle signs 
that God gave to get Jonah to do what God asked him to do. Now, I talked about a parallel. Has God given us a commission? What is the commission that we have? To go and take the gospel to every nation, tongue, language, and people. Um, <clears throat> the reason I said is Jonah alive. Have we done much better job than Jonah did at first? Now we might not have ran off to Tarsus or tried to go there. But we just stayed in our recliner when we maybe should have been uh, witnessing. Or we went to uh, shop at Walmart uh, when we really didn't need to go. Because we really didn't want to go. Especially to someone that we don't like. Or it seems to be unpatriotic to talk to them. Or we know that person has cursed God and is not in harmony with God. And so he heads off to Tarsus. But you know, God has a way of bringing us around. And we're going to look at, just quickly review those signs. We talked about them last year. There are nine of them we talked about uh, last year, and we're going to uh, review those and deal with three more this morning. First of all, in verse 4, Jonah goes down uh, uh, and he gets on the, the boat. Uh, he flees uh, at Joppa and he's headed toward Tarsus. He gets on the boat and he goes down and remember he's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And guess what happened? The first miraculous sign, God sends a storm. Now these mariners had gone across the Mediterranean Sea and they knew how to tell when a storm was coming. There was no storm on the horizon. Uh, our meteorologist today would show uh, uh, the radar and show, hey, there's no storm in sight. And all of a sudden, boom, here's a storm. A miracle of God that's right around, it's not a general storm everywhere, but right around the boat that Jonah was on. And then notice the next sign that uh, something is amazing. In verse 6, the captain himself comes to talk to Jonah. When, when you're on a ship, does a captain come and talk to you? And uh, he asked him some questions. And then he says, get up and pray to your God. In the last part of verse 7, they cast lots. That's the way that they did. That was uh, throughout the world of that day. They wanted to find uh, from their gods and from the various means who is guilty or who is uh, what they should do. They cast lots. And guess what? On all the ones that are on the ship, guess who it fell on? Jonah. Another amazing thing. And then they asked who he was. And he said, I'm a Hebrew that worships a God, uh, the Creator God. Oh, now they're all afraid. And then we see the fourth sign. Notice these mariners ask the question of Jonah in verse 10. Why have you done this? Jonah, why are you fleeing from God? Isn't it amazing that God uses people who are not believers, who are pagan or heathen, sometimes to straighten us out? And so they ask, why have you done this? And then, the fifth thing, the sea is now growing worse. In other words, it's ramping up. The storm's getting worse and worse and worse. Remember, a storm out of nowhere, it's not the normal weather pattern. This is God doing it. To ram up the pressure to try to get Jonah 
to do what he should have done to start with. By the way, the lesson is, when God asks you to do something, do it right then. Don't wait until all kinds of other pressures happen. The reason we have some of the problems and temptations we have, we don't do the right thing the first time. And so more and more problems happen to us to try to wake us up to do what God really wants us to do and to be close to God. Well, as we go on, we see that in uh, verse... Uh, <clears throat> Verse 13, by the way, Joan admitted, he says, um, the storm came because of him. But Jonah was a legalist. How do I know that? Uh, he said to them, you want to stop this, throw me into the water. Well, how is that a legalist? Now Jonah could have just jumped in the water, could he? Why didn't Jonah do, jump into the water? Maybe uh, you don't have a mechanical mind, or maybe you do, like I do. I try to figure out why these things happen. If jo the simplest thing, if Jonah just said, "Okay, Lord," just knelt down and said, "Lord, I'll go. Let me get off the ship and I'll go to Nineveh," everything would have stopped. That would have been the simplest, easiest way. And let me tell you, if you are going through something because you're running away from what God wants you to do, just get down on your knees and say, Lord, okay, I'm, I'm through with rebellion. I'll do what you want me to do. And it will take you right out of whatever mess you're in. But Jonah didn't do that. And not only that, Jonah didn't jump in himself. He says, throw me in. Why? Why? Legalistic, he thought, well, look, if I commit suicide, then uh, I'm, I'm doomed. Now, by the way, I don't... That's a whole other issue. This was from Jonah's point of view that we're talking about here. I, I, the sermon's not about that this morning. But then, notice what did... What did they do? The men do in verse 13. These mariners... Uh, you know, I don't know if, if I were on board there, if it was one of them, I think I would have a tendency to say, okay, let's throw him in. But they respected Jonah's life more than Jonah respected his life at this point. What did they do? In verse 13, they rode harder. They were trying their best. They uh, threw some things over, rode harder. They were trying to save Jonah. But then, we have in verse 14, kind of a miracle itself, then they started praying to the God of heaven. They were heathen, but now they're starting to pray to the God of heaven. Don't hold us accountable for this man. They're getting ready to throw him over now, but they're, uh, Lord, don't uh, hold this against us. And so then we find that they throw him overboard there in uh, verse 15. Now what was amazing, as soon as Jonah hit the water, the storm stopped. Boom. Could you imagine being one of those sailors? The storm comes up like that, Jonah hits the water, and it stops immediately. Well, they feared the Lord and sacrificed, made vows to the Lord. But notice, God is so merciful, even in rebellion, that in verse 17, the Lord, and this is where we're starting into the message today. The Lord had prepared a great fish. I've heard and seen a lot of people try to figure out what kind of fish it was or whale it was that swallowed him. Well, let me tell you, this was a custom-made fish by God. Whatever it is, unless it's lived a lot longer, it's not around now. 
This was a customization, a miracle of God that He made the fish that swallowed Jonah that Jonah could survive three days and three nights in. And that's what happened. And before I go any further, you know, three times Jesus refers to Jonah and talking about as a sign he said they all were seeking a sign there no sign given except the sign of Jonah Jonah in his experience was a type of message they wanted a sign greater than Jonah that's why he said the uh, our sign greater than the prophets you see all the miracles that Jesus did on earth they said well look Raising people from the dead, Elisha did that. Uh, feeding uh, the 5,000, one uh, Moses fed uh, a million people and more. Uh, talking about leprosy being healed. Well, Elisha did that too, didn't he? So how is how are you greater? How are you the Messiah? And Jesus quotes Jonah as there's no sign given this generation except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the, well, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be. But by the way, his sign was greater. Remember, Jonah never died, Jesus did. Remember, uh, on the fish's mouth, there was no Roman uh, uh, seal, but there was on the stone on his tomb. There were no Roman guards uh, uh, keeping Jonah from coming on land and going on, but the Roman guards were there to keep Jesus in the tomb. Jesus' sign was greater, yes. But wait a minute, the sign of Jesus, the real sign was about to happen. Jonah gave a message to the Ninevites that 120,000 people believed. It was through Jesus that the world could believe and be saved. And you see, when we look at this, and, and if you want to look up the three texts about Jonah, it's uh, Matthew 12, 40, uh, Matthew 16, 4, and in Luke eleven thirty. Those are the three texts that Jesus refers to Jonah. And so now, notice, it just mentions the three days and three nights that Jonah was there. And by the way, that is, um, uh, some who have gone off the deep end saying that is exactly 72 hours. They have missed the whole boat. Uh, it is inclusive reckoning. I don't have time to do that. I have an hour and a half presentation on it. If, uh, if those who really have a problem with it. But the point is that how long it was in in. Uh, to fulfill everything Jesus had to die in the evening of the 14th day according to the Old Testament uh, the time the Passover uh, was to be slain and was to resurrect and go to the throne he was the first fruits and it had to be early the 16th day so it was late on the 14th early the 16th and that's the inclusive reckoning that were used by the Jews. But wait a minute. What's the first word of verse 1 of chapter 2? What is it? What? Then. Now you remember chapters and verses were not in the original language. He just says that... Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. Then, talking about hard headed. I don't know about you, but within the first five, ten minutes being in the fish's belly, I, I might be thinking about talking to the Lord. 
He was there three days and three nights, and then, now, he starts praying. And our message today is basically about his prayer. So then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because, my, uh, because of my affliction. And he answered me. By the way, there in the last part of verse, the verse, um, and, he, uh, and you heard my voice from the belly of Sheol, or the grave, because that fish was going to be his grave, wasn't it? If he had stayed in the fish's belly, that was it, right? But the miracle is God heard him. I, even after giving nine signs and he'd spent three and a half days there waiting to see what would happen. You see, he would rather die than go to Nineveh. That's why he said throw him overboard. Now he's in the fish's belly. Well, he's waiting for to die in the fish's belly. But God gave him enough time. Three and a half days. Or three days and three nights. Now he decides, well, I better talk to the Lord. By the way, how long is it from the time God has called us to take the gospel message to somebody that we do it? Sometimes it's longer than three and a half days. Or a week. Or even a year. What about our neighbors and family? What about the homeless person? What about the uh, business person? The ones that get under our skin or we don't like. They're different than we are. You see, it's speaking to us. Jonah had prejudice in his life. He shouldn't have, but he did. And if we're all honest, we are born with and around us, we have some prejudice. Hopefully, it's getting less and less. But there are people we don't like as well as other people, right? In fact, there are some people uh, that we might uh, agree with Jonah. We don't want the gospel to go to them. We don't want them to be saved. He didn't want the Ninevites to be saved. And he knew God was such a loving God. If he goes up there and preaches, they liable to, to change and God was not going to destroy them after all. But now he's praying. And notice it says not only did he hear, but he answered me. God will answer your prayers even in the worst state of rebellion you're in. Once you come to an attitude, okay, Lord, um, <clears throat> I realize I was wrong. That's a prayer that God will always answer. And then it says, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard me. The last part of verse 2. Verse 3. There are four things that he is trying to show how bad it is. In Hebrew, when you read in the Bible, when you read a statement about something, and then it restates the same thing in different words, it's a way of putting an exclamation mark after it or underscoring it. In other words, this is important. But here, it's not just twice. Not just three times, but four times. Let's notice. Let's notice what it is there in verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and your billows and your waves passed over me. I'm sure that 
he is underscoring how bad it was to be in the fish's belly. And so he didn't just say, hey, the water's covered me and that was it. No. And he didn't just say it twice. He said it three times and four, and four times. This is really bad. A lot worse than he had thought. And he had already been there three days and three nights. Then we find it coming back to his prayer in verse 4. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Now the Jews, their custom of praying, because God was, His dwelling was to be in the temple, was to face the temple as they prayed. Wherever they were, they faced the temple to pray. And that was their showing they worshiped the true God of heaven, not the pagan gods. And, and now, He is saying in His Jewish uh, way. Okay, I'm going to look back at the temple, not my way. I'm going to look back at the temple, Lord, and I'm willing now to listen. I'm willing now to be in harmony. And then again, he goes back another four times. A parallel, another four, and even a fifth time as we look at verses 5 and 6. The waters come, uh, come past me, even to my soul. Now notice he is using now, not only did they come past me, even to the soul, trying to emphasize how bad it was. Let's go to the next point. The deep closed around me. I'm totally closed in. And then the weeds were wrapped about my head. Trying to get a, a fuller... How, could you imagine being in the fish's belly and all the weeds and all the stuff there and wrapped about... He's trying to emphasize how bad this is. And then, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The roots or the foundations or the bottoms... I went down as far down as you can go. I was there. And then this last one. The earth with its bars closed behind me. What's the next word? Forever. Now, by the way, this is the shortest forever in the Bible. But let me tell you, if you had been three days and three nights in the fish's belly, do you think it would have seemed forever to you? In fact, ten minutes probably would be. How many of us have said, you know, I was in that traffic jam forever. I was in that line at Walmart or I was in, uh, uh, you know, whatever it was, forever. Emphasizing how bad it was, not the exact length of time. And did you notice five now, one after another, and he ends this one back forever. So emphasizing to the hilt how bad it was. And then I like the last part of verse 6, and here's the eleventh miraculous sign. Yet... You have brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. Yeah, I was there. It was bad. Worse than anything you could ever imagine or experience. But the Lord heard me, and you brought me up out of the pit. Wherever you are in life, regardless how bad it gets, when you turn to the Lord, the Lord will bring you out of your pit. That's a promise. If He would do that for a rebellious prophet who had neglected nine signs and miracles of trying to get Him straightened out, certainly He would do it for us. And then, verse 7. 
When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Remember that. I remembered the Lord. When it seems like you can't go on, your life faints away, it seems like there is no hope, it seems like there's no way out. He said, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Then he brings the contrast. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Do you realize when you try to do it your way, sometimes we think of the worthless idols only as uh, those things of gold and silver that the pagans bow down and worship. But have you realized that our worthless idols sometimes can be our own ways of trying to get the thing done our way or doing our way instead of God's way? And it's a real message for us. The do-it-yourself religion, the way of you solving problems, or you're the one to choose who to give the gospel to and who not to instead of God. I challenge you. Remember what it says here. Forsake their own mercy. When you're trying to do it your way, when you're trying to, uh, to have your way and give the gospel only to who you want to give it to or not give it at all, you are destroying your own mercy. One reason God wants us to share the gospel is to save us as well as them. You see, the point... He could have had angels. He could have done all kinds of ways to share the gospel. But he knows that we need to share the gospel to understand the gospel. The more of grace that we share, the more grace we receive. The more of God's Word and the truth of God we share, the more we have. And therefore, when he's talking about those who regard worthless idols, forsake their own mercy. When you have a gospel, or you have a message, other than what God has called you to give, you are in a self-destructive way because you will not have the mercy that God... Because until He was willing to lay down His own idols, Jonah was still in the fish's belly. He did not have the mercy of God that he knew God had for him. And then he says, but I, will re I, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Okay, Lord, I'm willing to straighten up. I'm willing to sacrifice to you. What sacrifice are we willing to sacrifice? In the Old Testament, they brought uh, their very livelihood, their, their hopes, their security, and sacrificing an animal that meant not only money, but security uh, for their family, food for their family, uh, the, uh, the wool for the clothing, the family, the whole thing. They brought that. And also, I'm willing to pay 
what I have vowed. Most of us don't think much about our vows. We talk about baptismal vows or whatever. Do you realize when you come to Jesus and you accept His grace and His salvation, you are vowing to share that with others? That's part of the vow of being a Christian. And if we are not actively doing it, we have broken our vow. Jonah realized that and he said, okay, I'm going to pay what I vowed. As a prophet, I have vowed to share your word, your gospel. I refused to do that when I went, uh, refused to go to Nineveh. Okay, I'm willing to straighten up. And he realized salvation is of the Lord. The only salvation that we can have out of this world and for eternity is in the Lord. It's the Lord's way, the Lord's mercy, the Lord's grace, the Lord's forgiveness, the Lord's power. Salvation is of the Lord. By the way, Notice what happened when Jonah said, okay, I'll make that sacrifice. I'll pay my vows. Salvation is of the Lord. Verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. This is an absolute miracle. By the way, he vomited him where? On what? Oh, it wasn't in the water. On dry land? You know, you hear about, and they've been in the news about beached whales, you know, lately. Well, he came up and Jonah didn't even have to get wet coming out of the... Didn't have to go into the water. He'd been in the water enough. That's not where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be going to none. But that 12th miracle is Jonah came up out of the fish's belly by God. Jonah had no way out. And listen, you have no way out of this world and what the world wants to do to you and what Satan wants to do to you. You have of yourself no way out. But salvation is of the Lord. And God always has a way out for you. He always has a way out for you. But the problem is, how? what is the way out that Jonah found? It's not until he was willing to sacrifice his own way. To throw away his idols, his own way, his own prejudice, and all the rest to say, okay, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. And so, so Jonah now is thrown out on the land. We're going to pick this up next week about Jonah chapter 3. But is Jonah alive today? Are we still running from what God wants us to do? Or maybe we're not running, we're just ignoring it. We're walking our own way. We don't realize that our salvation, as well as others, depend upon our sharing the gospel. God wants a win-win situation. He wants us to be saved. He wants the world to be saved. And we're part of that. Or we're supposed to be. If we are not part of that, then we won't be part of the salvation. I don't have enough time here this morning to show you that. Biblically and from the spirit of prophecy. But it is true. God wants us to share 
salvation and prepare this world for a greater trauma than what Jonah did for Nineveh. Nineveh was about to, unless they turned, about to receive the fire falling down. By the way, is the fire coming? We are to help people to be ready for Jesus coming to be with Him instead of being in the fire. Yes, is Jonah alive? Sadly, he is in what we have been doing. However, I'm glad to see Jonah finally woke up and God let him out of that fish miraculously. Some of us are hard-headed like Jonah and it might take 12 signs to get us to go. But my challenge is that you surrender all to Jesus now before you have to go through the fish's belly. Before you have to go through the worst storms of life and be in the fish's belly and have all the signs. It would have been so much easier if Jonah had just gone to Nineveh. And it would be so much easier if we just do what God asked us to do. I'm going to ask you this morning. Because we're going to see in the book of Jonah ourselves. Are you willing to say, I'll make the sacrifice. I realize salvation is the Lord. I will pay my vows. Not that we earn our way, but it just shows we come in harmony with God. Do you realize in sharing the gospel, you become partners with Jesus in sharing the good news of the gospel? He wants us to share the gospel so we can be closer to Him. It's not just a matter of works. It's a relationship that we are closer to Him in relationship and in salvation. And we can rejoice with Him over those who come to Him. So I'm going to ask you this morning, if you want to say, by God's grace, I want to pay my vows, I want to sacrifice to the Lord in doing what God has asked us to do in sharing the gospel with the world to prepare it for Jesus coming. If that is your desire, would you stand with me wherever you are right now? Now this is not for me or someone else around. This is between you and the Lord. And I want us to sing this song, number 309. Number 309, all to Jesus, I surrender. That's the testimony, the testimony of us to God that we are making the sacrifice and the vow that we want to not be in the fish's belly, but we want to be out and we're willing to do what He says before we ever have to go through what John let us sing number 309 as our testimony.